what I will do is outline a valuation framework that is based on fundamentals, as I just said. And more precisely, I will propose a dynamic model that relates the price of token to observable statistics, so, such as the share of tokens held by active users or the velocity of circulation of these tokens. So why do you think this is interesting? Right now, the practice in the industry is a bit rudimentary in the sense that crypto investors rely on ad hoc pricing formula that are based on the quantity theory of money. Now, the quantity theory of money is an antiquated approach that has many uh, default. And instead, we will propose a micro-funded approach based on the token in advance constraints. So economists will know what I'm talking about. For those that are not familiar with the concept, I will explain it in detail in a couple of slides. Now, the advantage of the model is that it will endogenize the velocity of circulation of tokens and so provide a first step towards micro-funded pricing model for the benchmarking and rating of ICO, which is sorely lacking at the moment. In terms of its side, we will clarify the condition under which tokens are valuable and the trade-offs of ICO financing. The two main findings are the following. First, if you rely on tokens, you will foster adoption because tokens, we will see, lower the opportunity cost of holding reserves. I will explain that in a few slides. And then, uh, this is not really new. Some people have already noticed that. But a more original insight of our approach is that tokens during the adoption phase induce excess price volatility. So what we will get from the model, which I think is quite interesting, is that early on, you will have a speculative phase where most token will be held by speculator, not user. And on top of that, the price of the token will be very volatile. So volatility and low adoption are two of the most often advanced criticism against token. So obser observers see that this is a market where you have very low adoption, the price go up and down, and it's often seen as a symptoms of excess speculation. And also we cannot rule out that this is true. Indeed, the market for token is very speculative. What is interesting is that these two features also arise in a fully rational model based on fundamentals. So in some sense, our model explain a little bit, I explain what we see in the token market. So in the interest of time, I will skip the related literature and directly present the model. So our setup is as follows. We have two markets, a good market where tokens are exchanged against the platform's output and a financial market where tokens are bought using fiat money. So you, Although tokens can be used outside blockchain, okay, so they have been introduced by blockchain because there is this commitment advantage of blockchain where you can commit to the monetary mass of token. In practice, you could introduce token on a centralized platform, and Facebook, for, for instance, is thinking about that. But here we want to think more of a decentralized environment. So the output of the platform is, will be produced by contributors. Think of them as miners, so contributors to the platform. And the supply from contributor will be increasing in the fiat value of the payments. Okay, the contributors, they don't really care about the token. They care about the value of this token in fiat. So we have this external currency, which we call fiat. Can be, you can think of it as dollar or euro if you want. Now, what are the user's preferences? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about people that want to use the platform. So to be precise, let's take an example. Think about Ethereum. So Ether is not really a means of payment. It's not a cryptocurrency, although it's, it is used as such right now. But normally, it should be at the core. It's a utility token. Because if you want to access Ethereum's computer, so that's the service you want to access, some decentralized computing power, then you have to use Ether. Okay? So there are really utility tokens in that respect, because you can only use this computer with the Ether, with that specific token. So now you're a user and you want, what is the benefits you get from using this decentralized computer? We assume that the preferences have the following form. So U calligraphic of C, D, I. So C is the amount of services that is consumed from the platform. And D, I is a dummy variable, which in the I index the user. So that's for user I. And the dummy takes value zero and one. So when D has value zero 
and this occurs with probability one minus lambda, you don't want to use the platform. You have no use for the services of the platform. On the contrary, with probability lambda, D will be equal to one, and then you will, you will get a utility of UC, okay, a positive utility. You will want to access the platform. And the utility you see, the small u, is just the standard utility uh, increasing uh, concave, et cetera. Now, what is the timing? Here comes the token in advance aspect of the model. At the beginning of the period, your shock D is revealed. So at the beginning of the period, you know whether you want to use the platform or not. Let's say you, need, you have a smart contract on Ethereum and you realize that you're in a state of the world where you want to execute that smart contract. Then at the middle of the period, you, the, the financial market open and you exchange tokens. And then at T plus one, you start again. Now, the key thing is that at the beginning of the period, when the shock is revealed, if you don't have tokens, you cannot use the service. So that's what we call the token in advance constraint. The only way you can use the service is that if in the middle of the previous period, you bought some token and you carry them over to the next period and you have some reserves. Okay, it's an assumption, it's a strong assumption, but okay, economists know this, we are used to use that trick to justify why people hold money. Let me explain what, uh, what is the problem of the user now. Some notation, M is, are the token holdings of the user, small m. Lambda is the probability at which the user will need the service, R is the interest rate, U of C is your utility, and P is the price of the token in fiat money, so the exchange rate, if you want. So the value, the utility flow, V, P, T, P, T plus one, of a user is the following. First, the user has to decide how much tokens he wants to buy, and then, it will decide how much to consume. So you want to consume only with the probability lambda, right? Because with probability one minus lambda, you don't need the service. So with probability lambda, you will decide how much you consume. Okay, so as if you, you consume, you get UTT of C and what is left of your token because M is your reserve. So C M minus C divided by PT plus one, you can sell again on the financial market. So that's the financial return on what you have not consumed out of your token. Now notice the constraint on C, C cannot be higher than MPT plus one. That's really the token in advance constraint. You cannot consume more than the fiat value of your reserves. Now with the complementarity probability one minus lambda, you don't consume and you have the financial value of your token, MPT plus one, and then you have to subtract the opportunity cost, so the interest lost on your token, okay? Because in the previous period, instead of buying reserve, you could have play, place, place your money on the financial market and earn the interest rate R. In other, in other terms, one plus R MPT is the carry cost of your reserves. Okay. Now, remember that, so one thing you notice is that if you use the token, you know exactly how much you need. So that's an assumption we could have made also U of C stochastic. So maybe in some period you need a lot of them, in some period you need a little bit of them. There's no randomness in that respect. This simplifies the analysis quite a bit because then what you can show is that the user will only buy the amount of token which he, he will always, sorry, he will always consume all the token he has taken in reserves. A slide of justification on this assumption. So in a way it's a strong assumption but we believe that it captures a few well, realistic features of the token market. First, the technology, decentralized application and smart contracts often require an immediate reaction, immediate access to the, con to the smart contract. Think for, ex for instance of a financial smart contract, then the state of the world happen. If you have not provided your smart contract with tokens, then you won't be able to do the transaction and you will lose the benefit of your smart contract. So usually you have to respond immediately, okay? Another feature that is supporting our token in advance constraint is that maybe you can buy the token on the fly, but it turns out that if you do so, you have significant transaction fees. Here is an example from Binance where we tried to buy maker token against US dollar with a credit card. So that's on the fly nearly, it's nearly automatic. So the, the exchange rate was 555, okay? Now you can see in the right box, 
that if you spend the exchange rate, you only get 0.98 makers, meaning that they charge you an interest rate of 1.5% if you want to buy on the fly. So given this interest rate, this transaction fees, you prefer to hold reserve in advance, pay low transaction fee, and then use them when you need them. So in the model, we take this assumption to the extreme. We say you cannot do it on the fly. It's too costly. And a more in-between approach will introduce a transaction fee and really endogenize your uh, reserves. So that being said, let's look at the problem of the agent. So as I said, th there is no uncertainty about how much consumption you will need if you need to consume. So what you do is you minimize your token holding. So you just buy the quantity of tokens, which is equal to the amount of consumption you will need in case you are hit by a positive utility shock. So we can forget about C or set C equal to MP. And then the problem is simpler. You just maximize your reserve under first you have the utility lambda U, then one minus lambda is when you don't use the token. And then you have the opportunity cost one plus R. Now you see one thing is that M is indexed with respect to T and the price is T plus one, because if you remember the timing, you choose your reserve in the middle of the previous period. So your reserve are what you bought at, at T plus one, your reserve at T plus one are what you bought at T, so MT. Now, if you just take a first order condition, you get the law of motion for price. And it's very simple. The price is, gi is given by two components. You have a capital gain. So the token might appreci appreciate or depreciate, PT plus one minus PT. And then you have a convenience yield, which is the utility you get from the token when you consume it. So what is the utility? It's the marginal utility U prime minus one, which is the price. Everything is multiplied by PT because the, the price, I mean, the, you get as much services as the value in fiat of your tokens, okay? So this convenience here will be positive. So the marginal utility will be higher than one. You will have a positive rent when you use the service. And this will incentivize user to all token. So this is the basic structure from, upon which we will build. First, you can look at the steady state price very easy. So let big M denote the overall mass of tokens. So this is the amount of tokens that is supplied by the platform. So typically you make an ICO and you say, I create 1 billion tokens. And we will assume that this mass never change over time. So there is no monetary creation, no token burning. It's a simplification. It will be really interesting to look at that in future research. And I think this afternoon we have a paper who does just that. So the mass is constant. This is a strong assumption, but by the way, it, it is satisfied by several tokens. So for instance, maker has a constant mass, more or less. So in the user are indexed by I and market clearing holds when the number of tokens held by user MI is equal to M because users are symmetric right now. And then you get the steady state price what you can see from this expression, P at is a steady state price, is that money is neutral. So that's the first thing. It's not very surprising. If you create more tokens at the ICO stage, let's say two times more token, you just divide the price by two and you change nothing. So it's really a real economy and the monetary mass has no real effect. So now let me go to the real model. So the overall mo for the real model, the, the fundamental model, the one we really want to build. And it's about gradual adoption. So what we will see is that you will have a feedback loop between the price of the token and user adoption. But for that, we need to have some dynamics. So now the utility of consumption also depends on the shifter Z, which capture technological progress. So in Ethereum, you can think right now they're trying to move to Ethereum 2.0. That's typically a technological shock. Suddenly, Ethereum is supposed to become much faster, easier to use, less delay, lower cost. So over time, your platform gets better and better. Now the shifter, we are economists, we don't model technology, we take it as given. And I will assume that technology follows the geometric Brownian motion, it moves over time randomly. Now you can show that the law of motion of price in continuous time, so P dot, which is the expectation of DP and not divided by PT, it's a, sorry, it's a typo, should have corrected it. So it's a bit of a abuse of notation, but it's coming from, I guess it's self-explanatory. So P dot is the evolution over time. You can see that the 
value function no, so the flow utility of users in continuous time has the same form than in a discrete time so lambda times the utility you get minus the token you lose when you access the service the capital gain p dot and the opportunity cost minus r and you can show that the optimal holding of token is m star is equal to one divided by p times u prime minus one now one interesting thing in this expression is exactly the same as the steady state except for one term p dot divided by p so let me see i don't know where i can i note my slide okay so you see the term p dot divided by p on the right in the last expression and uh, this is telling you that if the price of the token increase you are you have the incentive to hold more token it's not surprising now you have this token that gives you a service but on top of it maybe it's gaining value over time because more people are adopting the service so then you have more incentive to hold the token and so p dot divided by p reduces the carry cost it reduces the opportunity cost of holding reserve and so it incentivizes adoption of course if p dot is negative it's exactly the opposite if you expect the token to depreciate then you will have less of them okay now we will have also heterogeneous users so they have different technological proficiencies so some users are very good with computers maybe some of them at the conference the computer scientists so they have adopted a blockchain a long time ago and then the economists are very bad so they have a low low chi and so this is a fixed cost and you adopt the the service only when your flow utility v is superior to the fixed cost for one divided by chi because the fixed cost is inversely proportional to your proficiency and so you can show that the user base is just one minus g time one divided by v so that's the number of users at each point in time that uses the service it depends on the level of technology z and on the evolution of price so if the price grow faster you have more users because they see it as a financial instrument so now let me get to the main slide and the main insight of the paper the appreciation appreciation rate of token cannot exceed the interest rate because if it were to exceed the interest rate you will have no cost of holding them and so infinite demand so token cannot appreciate at, at a rate faster than this of course it's a risk adjusted rate no we are doing everything under a risk neutral measure so you can show that optimal token holdings and mass of users are bonded from above so you have m star is bonded from above by m upper bar n is bonded from above by n upper bar what does this mean it means that for every level of productivity there is a price level p upper bar such that user demand cannot clear the market when the price is higher than p upper bar so let's maybe it's easier to, to understand with a graph what you can show is that there is if you plot the price against the productivity you can show there is an investor regime and a user regime in the user regime the token price grows at a rate which is lower than r in the investor regime the token price grow at the rest r it cannot grow faster because otherwise you will have infinite demand for it okay so investor regime is a speculative regime where the market is not cleared by user it might be that very few people are using the token and that the demand most of the token are held by speculators i call them investor because i don't want to be polemical but you can think of them as speculators they only hold the token for financial gain they never think about using it in the user regime it's the opposite all the tokens are held by users okay sorry so to repeat now you have the law of motion of token will depend on whether the marginal holder is a user or an investor is a marginal holder is a user you have the same law of motion than before and you have this term here u prime p, p m divided by n which is minus one which is the convenience yield now people are holding token because they want to use them and this convenience yield lowers the appreciation rate which is necessary for them to invest in the token on the other end is the investor regime people the marginal holder never thinks about using the services it's just there to speculate so the price has to appreciate at the interest rate okay which is higher than the one in the so the appreciation rate is higher than in the user regime 
So now, very quickly, I can replace p dot by using uh, Ito's lemma. So that's z u p prime plus z six sigma squared divided by two p second uh, for those who are familiar. And I get a differential equation with two regimes. And I can, so I skip the detail. I really don't have time. You can find the two boundary conditions. So the price at zero has to be zero because it's an absorbing state. And then you have a condition at infinity. So now you have a differential equation, a second order ODE, complicated one, nonlinear, and piecewise, but still second order ODE. And you have two boundary conditions, so you can solve for it. So what we will do, so now I think, how long do I have? Like 10 minutes? Uh, no, no, uh, like uh, two or three minutes, maybe. <laughs> OK. OK, so we calibrated the model on Maker. So what you have here is the share of users, so the share of people that held the token, but wants to use the services and the price. So we are able to calibrate the model. The point here, as you see, is that on average, only 10% of token are held by user, 90% of token are held by speculator. And this is difficult to explain, but our model can fit that. And what we show is the, here you see, we have this price that goes from the speculator regime, enter the investor regime, the adoption rate goes up, the velocity is positively correlated with the price. So this is all microfunded. And what you see is that the return, so we are still in the investor regime, by the way, but when we will get to the user regime, if we do eventually, the return will drop to the interest rate because there is, now you have a convenience yield and the volatility will decrease. And that's the main new insight of the model. Why is the volatility decreasing? So why do you have high volatility in the speculator regime? It's not a coincidence. What you can show is the price function, you can solve for it in the investor regime, is a convex function of Z, Z times beta with beta superior to one. Why do you have convexity? If you remember your Jensen's inequality, and it's the same thing with Vito's lemma, if you take a convex transformation of a variable, the expected value of the convex transformation is higher than that of the underlying variable, okay? And this is exactly what happened. You take the fundamental Z, you take a price function which is convex, and this creates higher return. And you need this higher return to incentivize investors to acquire the token. So my point is that volatility is not due to speculation necessarily. It's a way to raise the return of the token above its fundamental level so that speculators find it profitable to hold the token. Now, the result is that, of course, bad news will have a very bad effect, and good news will have a very good effect, so a lot of fluctuation, OK? And OK, so let me say two things. First, there is a paper by Kong, and I think it will, an extension will be present later on. Kong and co-author will be present, presented later on in that uh, conference, which is very related to our model. But we use token in advance. They use token in the utility function, OK? So they had, don't have a speculator regime. That's the main difference. And let me conclude. So sorry for rushing a little bit. So let me conclude. So we have a valuation framework that is based on fundamentals. It's microphone metrics used by investors, such as the velocity of circulation of tokens, which is commonly used by people in the crypto community. But we don't really have a model that explains why it should be important, a microfunded model. And then the main new insight, I think, is that we rationalize the extreme volatility of token during the adoption phase because this ex excess volatility is precisely what allows token to have a return that is high enough to attract speculators. That's it. Thanks a lot.